the only people I trust are you two. Those fingers in my hair That's well, welcome everybody to another TV discussion. Uh, I'm Mike and I'm here with Dave. And as per tradition, we are talking about genre television. A little bit off our normal sci-fi path, but uh, Motherland Fort Salem is something that we watched in season one for our Sci-Fi Fidelity podcast, episode 99. And now we're here talking about the season two premiere. So I'm very excited about this, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I love the the historical speculative fiction. Uh, cer- you know, certainly... Uh, not unlike any of a number of shows like Man in the High Castle. And it's a good show. It's a fun show and the characters are likable. I love the premise. And, you know, here we are for season two. Right. And I think this is a wholly unique show that really gets into um, magic in a unique way. But just to catch us up and to give us a recap as we head into the premiere here, because maybe you watched the premiere, and, and by the way, spoiler warning, if you haven't, we are going to be talking about the season two premiere. But, you know, just to refresh your memory, if you watch the season two premiere and, and we're like, wait, what was going on? I, I can't quite remember. Hopefully this, this little intro will take care of that. We had 10 episodes in season one, and it gave us a closer look at the alternate history in which the United States has been protected by a witch-based military led by the eternally young General Sarah Alder, who masterminded the 1692 Salem Accord. So that's, we presume, where history had its uh, path forked. Right, Dave? Right, and that premise alone is enough to draw me in. And and she's a great character as well, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about her during the discussion, but she's one of those characters that, for me, I'm constantly reevaluating how I feel about her. Yeah, oh, for sure, because we just don't know, especially in this premiere, you know, we kind of had a, a, came into it with um, some not really great feelings about her. Um, But the, the occurrences of the finale and leading into this premiere, now there's a lot of question marks about her background that maybe we just don't know of the full story. So we're going to get into that. But um, we learned of some other factions of magic users. Of course, it's not just the army. We've got the spree who are sort of cast as terrorists. But again, just like you said with Alder, we're not quite sure. Uh, we might have a new spin on that in season two. And then we've got the Tareem, a very secretive group who have these songs that they fiercely protect from exploitation. Cause I guess they feel like the army is using magic for their weaponizing magic in a way that's not um, what it was intended for by whom I don't know, but just depends on your point of view, I guess. And then at the at very end of season one, we learned about the Camarilla, which is going to be something new, a historical witch hunter group, long thought extinguished, at least by Sarah Alder, who would have been around to, to know, I guess. And now they're using witch vocal cords, uh, kind of a bastardized version of their magic to wage their own war. And I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with the Camarilla and what we'll right, learn about I mean- them. I mean, as you said, we've got four distinct groups now to follow. One, of course, is the witch army. But, you know, you you mentioned the idea of terrorism and which is the terrorist group. And I would certainly take you back to Liberate versus CPS. At the end of the day, uh, maybe Liberate's not the terrorist group. Maybe it's the other way around. And, and as you said, right here, we're still not exactly sure you know, what people's motivations are, what they hope to get. And, and, you know, more background details are being revealed with each episode. Right. And that was a continuum reference for those who (laughs) didn't catch it. An old show that Dave and I got started with, but it's weird because they kind of undid a lot of things from the finale, which I'm not against. There's a lot of shows that do this, but basically we had ended with Abigail and rail uh, wandering around in Tareem country, having set off this witch bomb, which we, they, we, they don't know how they did it. We don't know how they did it. No one knows how they did it. It's got something probably to do with the mycelium that, that Rael touched in season one, but we're not totally sure. And then of course, the other thing that was kind of undone very quickly is, is Tally becoming one of Alder's biddies. Those, uh, little tribe of, of old people that follow her around and make hissing noises occasionally (laughs) that, uh, help Alder stay eternally young, among other things. That's very mysterious what, what their full role is because, you know, Tally, I think is going to maybe give us some insight as to, you know, what the biddy situation is all about. But of course that's all undone. 
Um, and then Scylla. Um, this, that's, this is not undone, but Scylla has basically returned to the spree to find her benefactor is actually Rail's mom, who was presumed dead. And now Scylla and us and eventually Rael maybe will have to figure out what is this all about? What is Rael's mom up to? What is the spree up to? Because I f- have the feeling it's not just, you know, taking out innocent, innocent lives in a shopping mall, as we saw in the season one premiere. Right. And will you be at all surprised if Alder lets us know that she knew her mother was alive all the time? I totally would not be surprised. I, right. To be honest, Dave, I wouldn't be surprised if others in the army, including, you know, perhaps Bell, General Bellwether, Bellwether, perhaps um, even Quartermain, Sergeant Quartermain, who knows? Uh, you know, a lot of them could have known a little bit right. more you about know, what you know, really was going on. We get to the end of, of season one and we get into season two and and a line that i've used many times in my review and i'm sure reviews and i'm sure you've used a similar line is that this show ended its first season like a series that knows it's coming back oh yeah and and obviously it's a bold move to make unless of course they had already been told they had season two but we've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of showrunners over the years and very often they don't know, especially with genre shows. But, you know, that incident you're referring to, the reversal that General Alder offers Tally, I, I, I think we know there's no darn way they're going to keep Tally as a 75 year old <laughs> through the rest of the series. And that, well, not to mention the makeup job wasn't totally <laughs> convincing. So. Right. <laughs> but that's OK. And, you know, but then we have to look at Oh, all right. Are we okay with them doing that? It, it's a great plot point, you know, her sacrificing her youth to save the general. And, and we love the general's reaction as well. But at the end of the day, we want Tally to be young. And as my wife always says, oh, you're fine with a witch army, but somehow, <laughs> you know, them having a spell to bring her youth back, you have a problem with that. Well, so. I, and it wasn't without its consequences, which we'll get to. So I like you, yes, if you're going to do something yes. like this, you're going to have to make it difficult and yes. and have lasting. Because I think even Alder is kind of like, oh, my gosh, is this even going to work? This is not how I'm supposed to get biddies under duress during wartime. That's just is not how it happened. She didn't have much choice. She would have died right there on the battlefield. Right. So really a cool uh, thing that happened in the finale that's going to have lasting consequences. It, it's funny because you think about the writer's room and, and we might we, we actually are going to have some content on Den of Geek dot com. Uh, some behind the scenes interviews with the cast and the showrunner um, from Lacey Bogger, I think, is doing those interviews. And so we should get some insight there. But you have to wonder in the writer's room if you actually have the finale having been written. Now, what are we going to do with it? you know, let's bring them back and do this right away. Or did they already have in mind that they were going to undo those things right away and just have those be a cliffhanger? Because I think it's very smooth, the transition of getting Tally in the premiere episode back to normal and Abigail and Rael back from the wilderness. I thought they'd be wandering for a long time, to be honest. Yeah, I, I did too. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me about this series, and it, and it really hit me hard, and I mean that in a good way in the season two premiere, is this band of sisters vibe and obviously i'm borrowing on the band of brothers uh you know uh, theme but it's just so powerful and it goes beyond the three young women because we see it out of the generals as well certainly in, in different situations and you know exhibited differently but the alder tally exchanges in this episode really again drive home you know, what it means to be part of this witch army. And, and it's really chilling at times. Yeah. And you just don't know what's hiding behind all this. And like, you just take it for granted. This is how it started. Salem Accords protecting things. But of course, if it's an alternate history, how much of the battling, how much of the, the very belligerent um, U S policy, <laughs> foreign policy is dictated by the, outlook of Sarah Alder, uh, or the army at large, because obviously it seems like they're having a lot more, um, wartime than maybe our version of history had, but one new character that was introduced, you made a continuum allusion earlier. And so it's appropriate that vice president silver's daughter, um, shows up at, in the opening singing in church, 
very compelling voice. Everyone's kind of leaning forward, melting stained glass to the horror of all. But then we find out this is the vice president's daughter and the vice president is played by Victor Webster, who is much beloved of us uh, Continuum fans. I uh, haven't seen him on sh- on TV for a while, at least in a show like this. So it's good to see him. And, and I think he's going to have a little bit of trepidation about what's going to happen with his daughter, whatever it might be. Right. And it's you know, a question of him not understanding. Really, I, I, I get that impression. He doesn't really understand what the witch army is all about and what handing over his daughter to Alder and the others actually means. Because I think if he did really have a good sense, while he might fear for his daughter's safety, as any father would if his daughter was in the military, I think he'd feel a lot better knowing that she's in such capable hands. Yeah. And I think he just doesn't understand how his daughter can be a witch if he isn't, but right. it's, we get a little bit of explanation, which we didn't have in season one about how it's passed down, down by the matriline, which isn't just a matriarchy type of social construct. It's that's genetic. So genetic it has as to, well, right? It has to come from the mother apparently. So, yeah. um, so he suspects his wife maybe already knew. We already saw that at the Bellwether wedding, there were some people who didn't even know they had a witch's mark. So it could be possible that his wife didn't know, but maybe she did. Um, she's tested and she is of the blood, which is where we get our um, the title of our episode, Of the Blood. By the way, episode directed by Amanda Tapping, another person we love seeing directing our genre television, since that seems to be her main milieu now, instead of acting as she did in Stargate. <laughs> Yeah. And you can't even say, uh, 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 you can't even attach the word alum to <laughs> her because she's basically either acted or directed in just about every genre show of consequence. Yeah. Anything that's filmed in Vancouver, I guess. <laughs> yes. But, uh, we talked about Tally being a bitty. Um, and I thought when I was starting to take my notes on this episode that this was going to be a th- whole thread. And it perhaps it will be in a sense uh, about the consequences of undoing her biddiness. But I thought it was interesting that she's still talking because of course the biddies don't really talk, but she slowly starts to withdraw. In fact, I think one of the biddies even looks at her one time and shakes her head. No, yes. don't talk about what it's like. And she's, um, you know, trying to tell a deal who's on the plane with her home, you know, what it is like to be bonded to Alder and she, if you get a sense that it's, it's quite um, strong and powerful and not unwanted on her part, even though it was something that, that she did kind of on a, on a, on the spur of the moment. So I thought it was very in- interesting that they kept it subtle with the description of the insight that she gained initially. And then when she pulled away from it, it's going to be all about the aftermath of that. But, right. Uh, I mean, obviously there are connections, but we don't know the extent to which they're going to mean anything. And at first, we're not even sure whether these are dreams or memories and whose memories or dreams they might be. <laughs> and she seems to be resigned to it. She, you know, her her unit for her uh, for, in her mind is gone. So this is her new life now. Right. Um, and so even when Alder, you know, proposes, I might have a way, it's kind of dangerous, but we might have a way to undo this. We've got people waiting in the wings that have been prepped for this all their lives. Do you want it? She said no. But then she finds out that her, her unit is still alive just minutes later. And she says, I'll take that deal now. Yeah, right. (laughs) I thought that is, but the bond didn't endure. And in fact, as the episode ends, you mentioned that we don't know if it's memories, but she does have that nightmare of some kind of jungle op. Not exactly sure what I get the sense that it's a memory of Alders, but what's really telling about it and what will carry through at least a few episodes, I'm sure is that um, they have lasting effects in real life. She was stung by this giant centipede in the dream and wakes up to find actual welts on her body. And uh, you know, that could be a negative side effect that, that the doctors, the healers will have to take a look at like Rael or, or maybe um, it's just some kind of, effect of that bond that she had. Right. right. Now, Kalita and Adil, they are, I don't want to say they're the most confusing characters for me, but uh, because I, I pretty much get what he's after. She's a little less uh, clear about her intentions. And is that because of her youth? 
Yeah. And she's also very forceful and like, she's the adult or right. the older one in this relationship. So she wants to, to dictate things and she does seem to have some great hidden power that maybe is very common among the Talim, who knows? But um, what's weird is that, you know, Kalita wants Rael to help Adil. What does that mean? And I think she specifically ascribes that to Rael because Rael gave, gave up her talisman that her mother gave her to protect her in battle instead to protect someone else, uh, a young child. So this is one of those things that she may think Rael is more of a kindred spirit, something that's not quite like uh, the Alder army, uh, because as we all, we know, she might not know, but we know from season one that Rael's magic is unconventional and has a, you know, religious chanting aspect to it. Unlike the singing that we typically see out of the army. So. Right. And there is that element of sacrifice that, that continues throughout the end of season one and into season two. You know, we already talked about Tally sacrificing her youth for the general, uh, Rael sacrificing her safety by giving up the talisman. And, and to a certain extent, even Abigail giving up all of the benefits that being the daughter of General Bellwether could afford her to be with, you know, the, the two young women that mean the most to her at this point in her life. And seemingly is uh, falling harder than she's used to doing um, with Adil. Because, of course, yeah. she's, she's got the... The triad of men that she hang, hung out with during, right, <laughs> during that holiday <laughs> last season, so, but yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's cool that she has that, especially since you know they all returned from battle, and of course they now find out they are going to war college because they weren't initially going to be admitted. That's why they were on the front lines at the end of season one. So yeah, she's she's uh, got some hum, some humility from this experience, especially since now she and Rael definitely want to know how they caused this witch bomb, and she's the one that talks um, Rael into maybe going ahead and confessing about it. Cause I think Rael was a little bit reluctant to even mention that it happened. Let's just keep this to ourselves, but yeah, they'd come right out and tell them. Yeah. And I'm glad it worked out that way because of course, as soon as she mentions keeping it from the general, we're wondering, all right, well, what's going to happen when the general eventually finds out, which we know of course she will and yet they quickly make that decision, no, as you said, to, you know, uh, fill her in on what actually happened. Um, and, and just to go back real quickly to the whole idea of the war college and the fact that they're sent out on this mission, believing that the war college is just not going to be in their future. And, and it certainly occurred to me at the time that, well, they're probably sending them out there because they are the best that they have in this situation and it's almost they don't want to cloud their heads with war college because they need them to focus on this mission at hand and it's such a great scene when quartermain calls them together and they're not sure what the heck she's going to tell them what did we do wrong now (laughs) yeah right (laughs) well it still was payback and in fact we're going to go through some of our questions and predictions at the end of this discussion but they tend to come up during discussion too. And one of them is, of course, is there going to be any consequence for them having learned about uh, General Alder puppeting the, the president during season one? Because Quartermain saw that and it was, you know, it had consequences there at the end of season one. The admission to war college is kind of undoing that, perhaps because of the tally bond, perhaps because of what they accomplished um, in extracting some of the Talim tribe, who knows? But it's really just about um, maybe Alder's own awakening. She saw her the facsimile of her sister outside that cave. What does that mean? We don't even know what that's all about. So I think we're going to gain some insight through Tally and through Alder herself that maybe will explain why she's now not, I wouldn't say regretting puppeting the president, but basically uh, seeing that these people who ratted her out have more to them and, and maybe... Um, will pull her back to the right path or to a different path than she would have otherwise taken. Yeah. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just can't imagine there's not going to be fallout from, from puppeting the president to keep her job. But uh, Scylla did uh, speaking of people <laughs> that um, maybe have, are having a change of heart. Uh, Scylla now back with the spree, re, you know, released by Quartermain, by the way, still, you know, kind of reeling from that from season one. 
And especially since Quartermain's still keeping an eye on her through these, um, what did they call it? A fetch. I see a fetch on the ceiling and she kind of does a mm-hmm. spell to counteract Quartermain spying on her from afar. What Quartermain is up to, I don't know, but Scylla is definitely learning a little bit more about um, the Sprees maybe changing their focus because a lot of their leadership has been taken out during a, a summit that they had in, in some Belgian restaurant somewhere. And so Rael's mother, who already was one of the, the main leaders, of course, and had put Scylla on her mission to begin with, is now maybe one of the only ones left of the of the leadership group. So now they don't, they're like, uh, forget about the army, forget about that. We got to focus on the Camarilla now. And so I don't know if we're maybe not going to learn too much about why they were the way they were. And maybe they'll be more focused on the common enemy. But, you know, season one did have that scene where, where they took over a soccer game, soccer stadium, and, and they all chanted, our ancient enemy has returned. And apparently, according to Rael's mom, that was supposed to be one of their regular terrorist attacks where everyone died. But instead, they used that time to warn the army, even though they didn't hear it, <laughs> that the Camarilla had returned and that maybe they need to work together to combat the witch hunters. Who knows? I mean, can we have two big bads in this series or has it turned you know, towards the Camarilla at this point? The season two big bad, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it's you mentioned Scylla and, and she's, again, one of those characters that is likely going to reevaluate the decisions he's made up to this point as more and more is revealed to her that maybe she didn't necessarily count on. And, and you know, again, may, maybe moving forward, we see her align herself, you know, with the other three young women. Which is an interesting dynamic because, of course, Rael initially just is like distraught at Scylla's De, you know, right. departure and eventually being told that she died when she learns that she didn't die. She's very upset and now is against the whole idea of her. Whereas we, we can clearly see that Scylla, her feelings for rail were totally real, even though the mission was what put her on that path to begin with. So Scylla is a definitely a sympathetic character, even though she's done a lot of bad things. Yeah. Um, and that's going to help us also transfer some of that sympathy, sympathy to the spree as is the fact that, the leader that we're presented with is Rael's mom, who we know has her own daughter's best, you know, interests at heart, right? So uh, something's got to be going. Do we? I don't <laughs> I know. I guess we don't know. <laughs> I yeah, guess we'll I find know. out. But I, that's what I love about this this um, season premiere is that it really just kind of switches gears slightly, but doesn't really give us much. So it's all speculation, really. Yeah. And, you know, I've mentioned several times, I, I enjoy the more traditional length episodes, the 43, 44 minute episodes, as opposed to you know, the 60 minute ones that seem to be so prevalent on, on a lot of the streaming services. But it's just amazing how much they fit into this episode without making it feel crammed. Uh, they develop certain new plot lines, extended other plot lines. And, you know, you still can do it in 43, 44 minutes with good writing. Right. Exactly. And, and so much good setup, including with the elements we were just talking about, because, you know, they, Scylla and Rael's mom go to this, you know, rally or tribute. No, I guess it's a vigil because they have candles. Right. And, um, and someone with a red armband is kind of, you know, talking about the army, not really having America's best interest at heart. And, you know, the army just won't fight the spree. You know, they need to get rid of all these terrorists that are taking out innocent people. And so the new goal, according to Rael's mom, is that this, this hate that we're seeing here, it's got, you know, a source, it's a disease and we need to find patient zero. And I assume they're maybe pointing their fingers at the Camarilla here, that Camar- the Cam- Camarilla are stirring up hate um, because they were the ones behind the attack on the Bellwether wedding, not the spree. Not the so, spree, yep. So we'll have to we'll see where that heads, but I, I can't wait to see that. And one of the things that really kind of was understated and didn't really get a lot of playtime until the witch explosion in the finale was this, you know, this mushroom idea the fact that rail just barely touched this wall of mushroom that the necromancers used in the um in the war college or wherever it was 
And it has these consequences of now they're finding mushroom covered bodies out in the wilderness that they caused through this explosion of black dust. Uh, really kind of weird because they, you know, don't know what caused it. Something to do with their bond that they have because they were, you know, holding hands and, and cast that magic together. But um, I just think that's fascinating because I don't think anyone knows. I think maybe Rael knows, but not very many other people know that it was because she touched that wall and the wall took something from her and the wall gave something to her. It's the way that it was explained in some of the behind the scenes video that free that Freeform had up on their site. So really kind of cool. Yeah. But we got to get into some questions and predictions, Dave. So if you have any to share along the way, please, <laughs> please let me know. But some of these we've already talked about. Uh, most of it, of course, deals with, um, you know, the backstory of General Alder. Will Tally's brief connection provide a, either a damning backstory or an enlightening history that, you know, makes it makes her more sympathetic? Or will it be both? Well, I think it'll probably be both. I think it'll be something more damning initially and Tally partly because of her youth and inexperience, will interpret it one way and Alder will be forced to explain the reality of what you think you saw and what you think you know. Yeah, and I would welcome that. I think General, General Alder is such a fascinating character and so well portrayed uh, so that it does have that balance. The, the actors playing this role uh, kind of portrays both uh, sympathy and evil <laughs> equally well. So that's kind of cool. But what is the mycelium really? We don't know where that comes from because it, it, obviously the source of magic is unknown in this particular show. And so does the mycelium want something? Does it have an agenda? Will the, will the study of what Abigail and Rael did by the army, will that become dangerous or will it you know provide insight? You know, it, it, Who's it going to be dangerous for? Is it going to be dangerous for the girls, for the army, for the mycelium? <laughs> you know, I almost get the sense that this, this uh, mushroom, this giant mushroom or whatever you want to call it, the mycelium is almost like a sentient being itself, or at least some kind of living being that has a, a sort of consciousness. Well, I definitely like that idea. And, you know, we certainly see and saw in season one, the girls learning to use their power, which, you know, as you've said, with some of them, Rael, especially it's, I mean, we know she can heal, but it's a lot deeper than just simply being a healer. Um, and, and you have to feel that because of the immense power, we saw the two of them generate out in the desert. Part of what we're going to see in season two, is they learn how to harness this power, is that it may get out of control at some point, you know, will they, you know, will they become, I, I hate the phrase drunk with power, but something else escapes me at the moment that, the, but I, you know, you know what I mean by that. And will the general and the others have to rein them back in not only for their own good, but for the good of the country. Oh, well, and just the idea that Alder would do that, considering she herself is drunk with the desire for the, Tareem magic. <laughs> right. And sure. it's so great. Like Kalita kind of shuts her down too. She's like, Oh, you want to learn some, some of my songs? Here you go. And then she completely like almost rips into her and her biddies. You're, you don't deserve it. You don't, you're not deserving of this magic. And, and so whether or not that will come into place too, especially with Adil's attachment to Abigail, where maybe some of the tree magic will come into play on their behalf. And, and then Alder will, will covet it through them. So there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, push and pull and and different motivations that might be in conflict with each other, good and bad, with with some of the relationships in the show. So that's great. That's great because that's the kind of conflicts that make for a really good uh, TV watching. Um, and of course, we already mentioned the the spree and whether or not they'll have to work together with the army. What Sil's new role going to be in that, and and what will we learn about Rail's mother? Uh, and I have the feeling that it's not all going to be good on that front. It's not all going to be like oh happy mother daughter reunion. <laughs> right. Well, I think the spree and the army are going to have to come together. The question is who will be the spree representative that works with general Alder 
And conventional wisdom tells us, oh, maybe it's going to be Rael's mom. And then we, of course, know they have a history, except it's not the history we thought because her mother didn't kill, right. uh, get killed. And, especially, and, and, you know, it's not like Rael's going to be OK with that. Oh, you're alive. I'm all happy and nothing else. No, she's going to be like, you led me to believe you were dead. And that's not cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? right. That had a lasting effect on her. So so definitely. um I'm waiting to see, like, how many episodes is it going to take before <laughs> Rael finds out that her mother's still alive? Um, but also, I, just because I can't wait to see more Victor Webster, I just can't, I'm just waiting to see what his daughter's uh, powers will, will, what consequences they'll have, um, how it's going to affect the politics of the U.S., because they really didn't get into that much. They had little touches of, like, international relations t- during certain meetings of which is around the world, and some interaction between Alder and the president last season. But I really would love to see the why, the bigger picture in terms of, um, you know, what the power struggles are, not just magical, but political as well. Well, right. And you have to then be concerned about his daughter's safety, because if anything happens to her, that's going to alter the political landscape tremendously. Yeah, I can't wait. So th- it's just great. You said that how they packed so much into this. And it's true. Just so many conflicts introduced new and continuing. And of course the switching gears for so many things as well is what we love to see in a season one, season two. It's one of those, we we mentioned the big bad coined by Buffy the vampire slayer. And this has that feel to it (laughs) in a sense where it switches the gears. So just a great show. And we can't wait to see the rest of it. If you're enjoying motherland Fort Salem and are a big fan of the show, comment down below uh, our video here and let us know your thoughts and maybe we'd love to see even the corrections. If, if we said something wrong, we'd love to see that too. And hopefully if you're interested, we'll, we'll go ahead and come back for a finale discussion as well. So hopefully you guys are enjoying Motherland Fort Salem and we'll see you at the next discussion.